Yo. Justin, hey. Yo. How's it going? It's going okay. I don't know if I've ever actually interacted with you <laughs> in person. Either. Never. <laughs> <laughs> it's um it's really cool to be interacting with you actually. Um uh, I was honestly you you stole the words out of my mouth. I was thinking about it today. I'm like, I don't think I've ever actually heard Justin Hibbs or Mark's voice at all. I talk to <laughs> yeah. Eric all the time. Yeah, not even the voices. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, Infinity, the inception was like 20 years ago. Happy 20 year anniversary, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> right. And that's that uh detail is definitely not lost on retro modding and incubate games they uh they definitely want to talk about how this is 20 years in the making um and i think a lot of interest uh a lot of interest rekindled itself when you put infinity out there open source five years ago yeah it's already been five years and you believe yeah. that <laughs> right so the, the one thing i wanted to ask where did the who who drew the original logo for infinity you said i think it was hit right Hideaki? yeah i think so anything uh, i guess if he was here he could tell us but um was there anything that inspired him to draw it the way he did or i guess he only drew it as pixel art in the beginning right yeah i think he went straight to pixel art for it um i mean I'm, i feel like we probably discussed the design a little bit together but um yeah i don't know if it was from anything and just what drew something that looked cool <laughs> and the the title screen was there any significance towards the um like the water or anything like that like purely like glitzy stuff <laughs> just wanted it to look all i guess an excuse to use parallax scrolling yeah there wasn't really any other place to use that i mean maybe in like a special cutscene or something but nice so yeah is that mark and we got hid oh oh and ask the man himself yeah, let's do it. Yo, Hello. Hey. I'm uh, I'm actually actually really uh, feel really privileged to be around you guys. Um, I don't know if I ever told you, but when I got pulled onto the team, pulled in is a bad word. <laughs> when I joined the team, <laughs> I uh, I felt super intimidated by all of you. I kind of was hoping to impress you guys. I didn't want to like get that impression from you guys saying oh who's this guy he's not you know he shouldn't be with us or anything so I, I always try to impress you guys <laughs> you're always like industry leaders to me even if we didn't actually release the game yeah I mean yeah I don't I don't consider myself an industry leader <laughs> um but uh I think I think some of you other folks have had actually success with game projects <laughs> But uh, yeah, I think I think everyone on the team was really good at their part. Um, yeah, and you're definitely no exception. Ah, uh, that's sweet. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically, Infinity was designed, I guess, as a sequel to your original. Was it a TI eighty two game? Right. Well, TI eighty three, but then yeah, I got ported to a few. <laughs> yeah. Um, how did you and and Hideaki meet? Mm, um, I guess. Both through, I mean, through the tiCalc.org community, I suppose. But also, I mean, uh, he had made um, one of the shell, like the popular shells for the TI-82. To launch a program, you usually needed a shell. Um, and especially on the TI-82, because you had to like hack it to even be able to run a program, like an hmm. assembly program. Right. And so right. um, that's probably how we got to talking is because we wanted to port the game and we kind of had to talk. <laughs> it's like Hiyaki was the guy. <laughs> um, yeah, I I was doing stuff for TID2. And then um, there was some news, news that Justin was doing some uh, Game Boy work on like Slashdot or, or wait, was that later? That was later because we did, you helped me port Jolton, I think, originally. But then... So yeah, we already knew each other by the time uh, the slash shot, this, uh, the announcement yeah, of this of the sequel. Yeah, was there anything you were setting up to do with the game? Um, I mean, I had wanted to make a role playing game since forever. I got into programming because I wanted to make games, and so it seemed like it was going to be the first real chance to get a role playing game done after lots of like, you know, 
engines and you know partial games so almost got there <laughs> and they probably wouldn't have had an engine for something like that anyway so you probably had to design yours from the ground up right um that's a good question i mean i don't i don't know if you, we would have even have thought to seek out an engine um but certainly ours is pretty special I, I don't think there's there's definitely nothing like it um as you know we pushed the platform to the limits there's a lot of crazy effects like um I guess some people can call them mode seven effects from the Super Nintendo, even though they're just scaling and rotation. Like you even did the, I guess it wasn't really a scale and rotation of the, the main, uh, what's it called? Uh, the overworld. overworld. Um, but you basically just sheared everything to like a somewhat of a 45 degree angle to the right or something. And it still looked incredible. Like it reminded me of like final fantasy six, when you go into the overworld and, and everything's just like a, coming at you. Right. It was, it was super cool. And then the first time I personally saw it when I was playing the game and I saw the, the screen peel itself out, I'm like, I didn't even know the Game Boy Color could do that. <laughs> and somehow you made the effect faster too for the, the demo that came out five years ago. Right. Uh, uh, the tra transition was pretty long. So I, I just made it, uh, I think I just made it twice as fast. Nice. Oh yeah, I think maybe when we were play testing, we're like, okay, this is actually kind of slow. <laughs> A lot of that stuff, I think you were just messing around. Like, I don't think we even sat down and were like, we should make a transition or we should <laughs> slant the overworld. I think, I think you just showed me, you're like, check out the overworld. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's what happened. I was just trying stuff out and then I was like, whoa, I can do stuff like this. Yeah, Hid was always doing stuff like, like that. I think one of the first things that he did was the variable width font, maybe. Yeah, so we didn't have like a tile per character. It was like a set of tiles uses like scratch pad that were like drawn on by pixels or something. I'm not a programmer, but from what I have heard in the past, variable with fonts and things like that actually slow the system down or they're a little bit higher in computing. Is that correct? Yeah, you have to do it on the fly. So yeah, it does take up resources. And I think one of the reasons it sort of works is because the game is frozen during that time. Like we're, we don't really right. let anything happen while the characters are being drawn. So I remember that part, um, Eric and I were talking about this and we noticed there was a little bit of differences in, in the script a bit too. Cause at that part, when Victor first shows up, the script had like some, I guess um, Mark would be able to answer this maybe next time we see him, but um, the script had some discrepancies between what's in the game and what's in the actual script. Obviously it's, um, the original script had some more harsher language, but I think it was probably because it was going to be on a Nintendo platform. Was there anything like you you had planned that you needed to change because it was going to be on a Nintendo platform? Hmm. I, I feel like that did come up. Language um, was probably the main thing. I don't think we really ever had like blood or anything like that. But I do seem to remember that stuff coming up because we did at one point we did talk to nintendo like even before getting a publisher you're supposed to go through some of their processes i could i could see that being changed. i don't know if that's why we changed it but i could see that being a change i know that um once the a lot of the game text was in the game itself most of the editing took place there so there were things that mark did to maybe tweak the language because he was always second guessing himself like he'd read He'd play the game and go, ah, this could be better said. And he'd change it in the game. And so it would, wouldn't match the script at that point. Like all the bookcases, that was like, I think after it was already in the game too. The, the story or just the feeling of the game when I was playing it, um, I, I got a lot of vibes from Final Fantasy IV and stuff in it. Just like the feeling I was getting from it. And it was really fun. Uh, I remember when I was playing through the game, I got to like the ice dungeon or something and i had to ask you for a newer build because the game kept crashing at one point i don't know if you remember that vaguely <laughs> there was there was the final dungeon where i was playing through it and um it was obviously a mistake but fingers crossed hopefully i can keep this in there when when you guys had the screen scrolling slower than it was supposed to and I think you fixed that in the final, like a later build, but I really loved it because it felt super eerie. 
Yeah, my guess is we probably used a slow, slow scroll in an event sequence just prior to that and forgot to set it back when the event <laughs> started. <laughs> um, that, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that is a cool effect. The, the key, of course, is making sure it like, you know, the user or the player can't like walk off the edge of the screen because this the camera isn't keeping up. Um, that's probably why it's the way it is. <laughs> you just got to turn up the, the random encounters. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And then reset the camera. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, did you both like assign each other specific jobs when you were creating the game officially before like the musicians and a lot of the story elements were done? Like, were you like, okay, I'm going to just, were you like, uh, I'm going to, um, create the text engine or whatever and and had you you go ahead and design those mountains we're going to need it for the the castle scene or anything like that well i think the programming division was pretty clear probably pretty quickly um that hid was really good at like the engine work mm. um and so that got delegated i think everything basically as soon as he <laughs> joined the project um but then he did start doing art which was, I don't know when, when that started happening. Maybe, maybe we, you know, we, one of our artists wasn't coming through um, and then he started taking over for all sorts of things. I think he even redid a bunch of stuff. And as we were discussing earlier, he did the title screen. Mm. Um, so that just kind of organically came about. Did you do all of the tile sets? Like that's a lot of tiles to do for one person, especially if you're programming at the same time. Um, well, I was doing like the, the tile editor and stuff when i was um i was doing some of this um in-game scripting i guess there were there was a lack of some types of tiles so i went ahead and um made them i think when um new tile sets started coming in um i would go in and and check if there were some more needed tiles and i would just add them uh, I think I was also looking to, uh, I don't know, normalize the style, styling of it. Was there um, any art styles that you were trying to go for? Like, were you trying to look like a, a Zelda or were you trying to look like Lufia or anything like that? Uh, I was going after like Final Fantasy, like four, five, six-ish. Mm. In a, in a handheld. Um, yeah, like that's... yeah. But gameplay wise, like Dragon Quest, but like um, when you walk, and like you hit a corner, you would like automatically dodge it. Mm. Like if you're, if you're halfway on a tile, then like you you like dodge. Yeah, originally it would you was full tile movement, and then at some point he'd change it to half tiles. Mm. Well, it, it would be kind of weird if you're walking against a full tile, and then he's just like, "No, I'm just gonna go around." Right. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I definitely see the Dragon Quest influence there because especially when the characters aren't moving, they're still going like this, right? <laughs> you know, I was gonna, I was thinking about this when you asked that question, Arena. I was like, what the, what was the influence mm -hmm. for like the, the battles? Um, definitely, uh, I'm curious what everyone's influences were in doing this. And I, but I was thinking for the map, like the overhead view, it was definitely, um, yeah. Dragon Quest or Ultima also both had that sort of like standing march plus the visible trailing party. Mm. Yeah, but it but it's played, but it sort of looked like a like a Final Fantasy, I guess. It's this it like blend of all sorts of things, I guess. Um, I'll try to think if there's any other influences that I might have come up with anywhere. But if anyone has any others to mention. Well, I know um, definitely when I could hear the, the Final Fantasy in, influence in, in Eric's com compositions, for sure. Um, yeah, I think, um, I think one of your biggest goals when you were making the music was that you were trying to get the simplicity of, of the original Final Fantasy NES kind of style, right? Yep. And I can remember thinking, um, there's a lot of... <laughs> Actually, this is a good question for you guys. Um, I tended to do a lot of effects. Like when I played Dragon Quest three on the Game Boy Color, I'm like, oh, how are they doing that reverb effect? So I started doing tons and tons of special little echo effects in the in the transition over with the Paragon five tracker. Uh, and I'm just wondering, like, did that 
like I'm, I'm sure that probably put up the, the sequential memory and, and stuff for, for your guys game. Like you, you must've had to accommodate a lot more memory for the, the sequences after I got to it. Actually, um, for the music, it was all in, um, it was all like built by Paragon, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I think they were like audio.bin files or something. Right, and it, that contained the program too. So all we had to do was um, call the uh, player and it would just start going automatically. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, there's probably some state, but probably the extra complexity of the music didn't change the amount of state maybe in the player. Oh, okay. Um, but I think we did have maybe... There was a time when we were concerned about the cartridge size. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that's still a concern now. <laughs> um, but I know we had to go from like one megabyte to two. Yeah. And it might have been because of Paragon stuff crossing over. Yeah, uh, four to have 25 songs on it, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I have like 50 songs in the game. So like, no. We should talk about the publishers. Like, how many publishers did you try to talk to about this? I know there was Crave. Crave was the last one, right? They were the last one, probably the ones that we got the first, definitely the ones we got the furthest, one we got the furthest with. Um, we talked to Nintendo. Uh, we talked to Square. Um, Square didn't want to do it. God, that would have been a, amazing if they could. Well, because they weren't doing Nintendo games at the time. Oh, that's right. They had that stupid feud. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so I don't even know how that would have worked. Were they merged with somebody at that point? Were they like Square EA or something? Yeah, they were Square EA. I think maybe we were going to try to go through EA. I, I know we definitely sent it to some others, but maybe we got a text response from like Capcom. Yeah, that's, I was going to say, I, I remember Capcom for some reason. Yeah, they might have like formally rejected us and then everyone else maybe just didn't respond to us. <laughs> Well, it was probably um, just because the Game Boy Color was at its end of the end of its life, so they probably just didn't want to, right? That was definitely the sense we got yeah. from Crave and Nintendo, the ones that we spoke with the most. But you both went to E3 at one time and you prepared an E3 demo, right? I don't really know how things go down over at E3, but there's like office rooms and stuff, I guess. And so, yeah, Crave was apparently showing the game around, although I don't I'm not 100% sure what that means exactly because they are the publisher. So I don't think they need to really sell the game to anybody else except the players. But uh, but yeah, there was some backroom showings, I think. Because it would have made sense for them to gauge interest from actual players if they were showing it on the floor to see if they would actually publish it, right? Yeah, I actually don't know what they were doing. <laughs> now that I think about it. <laughs> They were definitely on the fence and they were also, you know, trying to recruit us to, to make different games even. So, you know, they, they, they were the most serious publisher we were talking to, but they were also sort of like one foot in, one foot out. If not a different game, then at least like, you know, change the characters of the game and just, I don't know, we weren't into that. <laughs> no, I mean, that would have changed. Although, the I don't know, maybe that would have, maybe we would have published it <laughs> if it was, you know, Donald Duck or something. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine it was the first start of like Kingdom Hearts or something like that? <laughs> the one cool thing I, I love about retrobotting is they're taking this totally seriously. Like we're having, whenever they're not slammed, of course, we're having like Zoom meetings. Well, I guess Discord video uh, meetings once every every week, um, talking about stretch goals and things like that. So with the other publishers that were interested in stuff like that, I honestly do think that you choosing retro modding was was one of the best things personally um i mean they even introduced a new gaming department like they they actually created their own gaming company called incubate games um all oh, right before they weren't actually developing games yeah exactly now they're they're getting into publishing unmade game boy games and stuff and with the advent of game boy game maker or whatever called a game boy studio or something they're going to be publishing a lot more of them. By the way, maybe we can transition into the original sound engine that you guys were using. Was that part of a specific tool set or did you develop it yourself? Uh, I was making it myself. Um, actually, there was some something that we picked up earlier and we wanted 
to do away with licensing issues. So I made one from scratch. Did we start but, with a different one then? Yes, we started with something else. And yeah, I took a look around and it didn't look too difficult. So I just made something. But um, it wasn't very complicated. And I don't know, it wasn't very featureful either. So when Paragon came around, we were like, whoa, that, that does a lot more. I like the macro ability with it because you can... I don't know if you guys were ever isolated a lot of the channels. When I was learning the the file format, I, I go to Eric. I'm like, okay, I'm a lot better in this thing now. So let's add some like kick-ass drums and, and stuff. <laughs> I think Eric might remember that because um, I was doing things like uh, pitch sweep in channel one that would transition into a sustained note or something. So it would sound like there's kick drums being played while a sustained note was being played. And it was always one of those cool things. So maybe that's how we ended up using Paragon 5. Like easier to pull certain things off that I guess the homegrown one couldn't do. Well, yeah. And the homegrown one required like tons and tons. And cause I did actually take a look at it. Honestly, I only ever saw it like five years ago, but then I looked at it. And I'm like, okay, so this probably could have worked. You could have made it work, but you had to like seriously do a ton of tweaking to make it work. And the, the Paragon one was cool too, because I was using custom waveforms in channel three that you couldn't do in the other one. Uh, mm -hmm. Or maybe you could have if you did enough uh, changing around. But I remember using the same bass sample from the Kurtzweil K1200 uh, synthesizer, which you know Final Fantasy IV used as its bass sample. So it was always like, I don't know if you noticed, but a lot of the bass sounds in, in the music sounded kind of like Final Fantasy IV's bass sound. Oh. <laughs> I'll have to listen for that. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just um, because I love the the tone of that bass sample. I'm like, I'm using it in the Game Boy. So I ended up doing it. But there were other things like um, audio fade-ins and fade-outs with, uh, with a square wave or something in Channel 3, like with the sad song, actually. But it, it always makes a cool example of the original fight theme and how it used to sound like before I got to it. Like this was the first official game that I ever really worked on. And it was just like... You know, it made me uh, excited, actually. Um, kind of heartbroken that it never got released, but 20 years later, here we are. Very possible, very good possibility. Uh, okay, guys, I'll, I'll end the meeting here. Um, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. All right, have a good one. See you later. Bye. Bye.